Okay, let's get started. Welcome members and guests, and thank you for joining us for the Austin Young Chambers webinar, Navigating Your Career Search and Networking During COVID-19, presented by Texas McCombs MBA and MSTC. My name is Alicia Palacios Woods, and I serve as the President and CEO of the Austin Young Chamber. So whether you're a business owner, an entrepreneur, employee, or someone looking for your next opportunity, the Austin Young Chamber is dedicated to supporting area young professionals. We are adding new webinars, virtual programs, and resources available to you all the time. So stay tuned to our website, austinyc.org, and our social channels for the latest information. We want to thank our webinar sponsors today, Texas McCombs MBA and MSTC for supporting the Austin Young Chamber and our community of young professionals. The evening MBA at Texas McCombs is a prestigious graduate degree tailored to fit your schedule and goals. You'll continue to work full time while earning your MBA from a globally recognized university within a network of award-winning faculty and alumni making an impact across the globe. If you're ready, you can join Texas McCombs for an upcoming MBA event to learn more about program details, the admissions process, and of course, to ask any questions. The Texas McCombs Master of Science in Technology Commercialization Program is designed for working professionals and teaches students how to launch new businesses and products into the market, either through a venture of their own or an existing cooperation. Virtual information sessions will launch in June and the application to the class of 2022 will launch in August. Staff were available to answer your questions at mstc at mccombs.utexas.edu. Before we begin today's presentation, I just want to cover a few housekeeping items. This is a live recorded webinar. A link to watch today's presentation will be made available to you post event. And if you have any questions during the presentation, please add it to the Q&A tool at the bottom of your Zoom screen. We will try to answer as many questions as we can until our time ends at 1 p.m. So with that, it is now my pleasure to welcome our speaker today. Max Cozen recently joined Amazon in May where he will serve as an area manager for Austin, leading an operations team of over 400, focused on supporting expansion and growth of Amazon's global specialty fulfillment business. Most recently, he served as the senior partnership advisor for the McComb School of Business, and prior to that, served as the career and talent development consultant for the Texas McCombs MBA program. His career management journey began with multiple experiences in sports marketing and management with strong experiences building teams and culture. His successes have come from his abilities to develop genuine and lasting relationships with clients and team members with a positive energy and passion, passion evident to others. This summer, Max is beginning the study of his PhD in higher education leadership and policy at the University of Texas. Max, thank you so much for joining us today. The floor is all yours. All right, thank you so much for that intro, Alicia, and thank you again to the Austin Young Chamber. I'm a huge believer in what y'all are doing, and, and for those of you who joined this call, thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules, time at home, time at work, whatever you're doing. Um, investing in yourself is, is uh, and I told my students this when I was working at McCombs, you know, investing in yourself, there's nothing better than that, um, and it does, pay, it does pay off in big results, and today's just another example of that. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Give me one sec here. Okay, and everyone can see, right? Okay, so um, I'm gonna talk, uh, you already got my intro, um, but I'm gonna talk very briefly today because I really wanna make this interactive um, as much as possible. I think uh, I could spend all day talking about navigating career searches, networking, there's such broad topics, we really could spend a lot of time. What I really wanna focus though on is some of the high level points and then open up to you to make sure I'm addressing what you who are attending this um, want to get out of this. And so um, I'm going to cover just a, a few items, but it'll be brief, like literally about 10, 12 minutes, and then we'll jump into to your questions. And I guess, um, well, I think we're going to be typing those using the chat feature. So um, let's talk about what's going on right now. Um, I don't need to talk too much about COVID-19 in the sense that everybody knows there's been change, right? Um, we live in a time that obviously you've heard the words uncertainty, You've heard the words unprecedented. Um, and sometimes, uh, obviously, there's some, there's some negative connotations with what's going on, too, in terms of career and, oh, my goodness, you know, my job could be eliminated. 
Um, this is the lowest unemployment rate, you know, since the Great Depression. All of these things, which I'm not undermining those at all. Those are those are real things that are happening, and 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 I think those are appropriate words to use. I will say though, um, there, there probably isn't enough focus um, in in the media or anywhere really on the positives of this uh, of what we can get from this um, an event like this. And really, um, there are some from a networking standpoint and from a career standpoint. There's some positive things, and I've gone through it myself. And you mentioned my my journey to Amazon. That happened during this pandemic, and, and Amazon's not the only company hiring right now. Um, but I will tell you that the things I'm going to talk about today, um, if you embrace some of these and use these personally and, and, and use them in your professional world, um, you might be able to land an opportunity not only during this that you're excited about, but it can change the way you think. So the challenging thing about um, COVID-19 is obviously the, the numbers we've, we've, we just, we've discussed, right, with, or we've heard about with um, unemployment numbers and so forth. Um, layoffs you've heard about, right? The, the uncertainty, revenues down, things like that. But that said, let's talk about the positives. We have more time now than ever to learn and develop new skills, explore new career paths, make connections, build a network. That is true. People are home more than ever now. People have more time to actually uh, digress and, 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 and unwind a little bit and focus on things that they maybe otherwise were so caught up in their jobs or so caught up in an office environment per se that they wouldn't have time for these types of things. Also, when you're we're gonna get into this in networking a little bit, but when you're networking, you have a ton of time now uh, to connect with people and they're more available than they've ever been. I talked to a CEO uh, pretty recently, runs a chem uh, chemical company, who normally is making trips all over, the, all over the world right now, but now he's home on his couch, uh, working from home, just like the rest of us, or a lot of us, and so, uh, he has made himself more available and he's like, man, I, I actually want to talk to people. I wish more students would reach out to me because I, I kind of, I miss the human connection. People miss that human connection. And so when people are more available to connect than ever and they want to talk to human beings, this is a great time. You know, when you, when you used to have to network with people, you maybe set up a phone call and maybe you do a virtual, but most times it was try to get in person. Now you can go straight to a call like this where we're seeing people live on a screen. It's now become a normal thing to ask for someone's time in a virtual setting and be able to see them, uh, and they're just more open to it. I found this in my in my world as well. So um, more time. The question is, how will you spend your time? You know, when this pandemic is over, and again, it will eventually. We're going to have a, a vaccine, and um, there will be some normalcy. That uh, we don't know when that happens, but whenever that happens, you know, there are going to be things that last, and there's going to be things that go back to somewhat of what we've we've experienced in the past, right? So the question is, at the end of this, how will you look back on this time in your life? And will you be able to say, I did the things that I wanted to do. I learned the skills I wanted to do. I made that change in my career that I wanted to do, or that I, you know, I had this great discovery from something I, someone I talked to. Um, the, where will those light bulb moments happen for you? Because I promise you, if you invest some of the time into this stuff, those can happen for you. I know it certainly happened for me. Uh, I'll just tell you quickly with Amazon, uh, I had built a network and built relationships there and got called from a recruiter. Uh, and of course, I was very happy at McCombs. And by the way, great program. If you are thinking about going back and getting education, McCombs, the MBA program, MSTC program, great opportunities. Might be the time in your life to go consider that. Um, but for me, it was like reevaluating my career priorities uh, and looking at a chance to go change the world. Literally, Amazon as a company, as you know, is, is changing the world. They're changing the way people get things. They're saving lives. They're keeping small businesses afloat by literally delivering their products and services to, um, to consumers. Otherwise, who otherwise wouldn't be able to get those products uh, to people. And so being a part of that or being a small part of that is, is pretty amazing stuff. And um, I don't think without this pandemic, I probably would have explored it so closely, um, but I think it's forced me to. So again, how will you spend your time? And what I want to talk about here is having the growth mindset. You can have a fixed mindset or a growth mindset. A fixed mindset is you approach things and say, you know, I'm, I'm failing at this or my abilities aren't changing. I can't, I don't have these skills, so I'm, I'm not going to be able to do this. Um, I have a predetermined potential. When I get frustrated, I, I give up. And 80% of success in life, at least 80% is psychology. 20% is mechanics. So if you can master your psychology to flip from a fixed mindset over to this left side where it's a growth mindset, look at some of the things here. You can learn anything and do anything you want. Challenges like the one we're facing now actually help you grow. Your effort and your attitude determine your abilities. Feedback that you get is constructive. All right, I want to try new things. I'd like to try new things. And so, you know, there's no failing. There's only learning. These are things that you hear people with a growth mindset say. And we can all, probably all think of examples of people in our lives um, that we know or mentors or 
people we've listened to talk, maybe it was a TED Talks, where someone was showing you that growth mindset. And I would encourage you, if you can adopt this growth mindset, don't just do it during the pandemic, do it forever, because it will change the way you approach your career, it'll change the way you approach really anything, personal, professionally, it doesn't matter. Um, but if you get locked in this fixed mindset, which we can do, we all do it, um, you know, it, it really does hold you back from new things in life. All right. So when it, I'm going to talk briefly about career navigation, assess where you are right now, right? Are you happy in your current job? Are you contributing the way that you want? Are you following your passion? Because if not, or there's something you've always thought about doing, maybe now's the time to do it. Or maybe it's at least time to explore those things. And um, we have more time right now, as I mentioned earlier, to learn, explore different career paths, make connections, build your network. You have time and people are available to do it. So it's now the time to do that. Ask yourself, what industries do you want to learn about? Ask yourself, what skills do you want to acquire? Where can you get those skills? And start researching and creating a plan to doing that. There's a great book out there I'll mention called Design Your Life. Uh, it's, it takes a design thinking approach to career navigation. It's probably the best book I've read so far in career, career navigation. But um, Design Your Life is really, really cool, uh, written by two Stanford professors. And, and it's, it's really, I think it's becoming a major staple in teaching career. But I'd encourage you to do that. There's this exercise they go through called mind mapping where you get clear on, you get clear on what you want um, and what really matters to you. Um, and then also, who have you identified that has a career path or trajectory you want to follow? We all know we're on LinkedIn, right? And by the way, you can add me on LinkedIn. I'll always be a, a part of your, um, your circle after today because you took your time and invested it with me. But I would say, you know, who do you, who, who do you want to become or who, do you, who has a career path that interests you? And, have, and what can you ask them in, to find out about uh, how you could get those same skills or follow that same path or take pieces of their path, right? Now's the time to do it. I'll give you an example of something I went through. And this is a really great tool. Um, you can create this on your own. It's really easy. Um, and if you hit me up after this, I can kind of share it with you. But it's called the Life Matrix. And this was an, 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 uh, introduced to me at McCombs. I was actually working at McCombs as a career talent and development a consultant in the MBA program. And I got a call about a job. I got a few calls about jobs, right? Um, the good news is if you're good at what you do, you get recruited. Um, and so I'm always open to opportunities. And when I got this call from a sports team, I won't go into who. It's not relevant. But it was a sports team I was intrigued about the opportunity. And so uh, I said, God, you know, I don't know what, I don't know what I want to do because I really like what I'm doing at McCombs, but there is this really cool thing in sports and I have a background in sports and maybe I want to go back and doing that. And so one of my mentors uh, at the McCombs School of Business said, you know, you should look at the life matrix. And what this is, is you just lay out your career priorities on this left-hand column. You pick eight to 10 that you identify with and um, really take some time. Like when was the last time you sat down and wrote the eight or 10 most important things to you in your career. And by the way, this can change as you, as you age and whatever, right? As life, life changes, life happens. But you've got on this left-hand side, all these career priorities. So I, I listed them out and then I ranked them based on area of um, importance, right? Uh, number of importance. And then I weighted them uh, based out of a scale of 100%. And that was hard. This took some time to do because um, it's one thing to, to list these out. But then it's another thing to actually really think about, like, how important is this? And I've got to do it out of 100%. So it really makes you think about what's truly important to you. And then I just simply take the two teams, or sorry, the, the two jobs, stay at McCombs, or go join this new sports team. And what's really interesting is, as I did this, um, and actually, I, I'm actually realizing, I, 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 this is probably my earlier draft of it. But as I did this, it was very clear to me, McCombs was the winner. Because you score these out of one and two. Um, one is means it wins, right? It's, it's, this is the priority. You can do this out of three jobs, four jobs, doesn't matter. Two being, uh, that one's not as, um, th this one doesn't win, right? So the idea is the closer to one, the better. And um, my final draft, this was sort of a, an initial draft of it, but my final draft was it was pretty overwhelming once I did this exercise that it was the best interest for me to stay at McCombs. When I thought about what really mattered to me, um, that all those things were checked on the boxes and you can see 1.09 was my score, which is almost perfect, right? And you can do this with jobs, decisions, whatever, but it allows you to put a little bit of data behind it. Okay, jumping into networking real quick and then we're gonna open up to questions. You've got opportunities now to do learning interviews. You've all heard the term of informational interviews. Learning interviews to me are um, what, what I like to call them because to me it's not about information, it's about learning, actually learning. 
It's talking to someone to learn about industries and job functions. Um, obviously, it's great to do these virtually now. Uh, really, they're face-to-face -face if you do it in this, this section. Um, growing and cultivating your lifelong network and put yourself in the best position to landing a job. So what, what networking and learning interviews is not about is reaching out to someone that has a job and asking them about that job. It's, it's reaching out to learn from someone about a company, a job function, and building a relationship and then keeping that relationship going, following up. If you focus on that, you're gonna do better in networking in general. And so yeah, we can't get together now and do these like fun happy hours that I know Austin Young Chamber puts on, um, but what we can do is we can attend sessions like this or virtual sessions, or we can go and use LinkedIn and reach out to people that have a, a career path we're interested in and kind of walk through that uh, together. And, and that person could become part of our network. Uh, and again, that's what I did with Amazon. I didn't search for jobs at Amazon. I, I built networks and over time opportunities came, right? So um, I think that's most important. So this is sort of an idea of just making sure you're focusing on learning. Here's a quick example of an outreach you can send. Um, we did this at McCombs, so uh, you'll see this was an example. We taught some students, but essentially it's short and to the point, reaching out using our database that we had there. You know, it says, it obviously says my name, an intro, saw your alum from our program, and we're both members of the Austin Chamber, shows some commonality. Um, I'm exploring a career path in product management, you've got a tremendous amount of experience and exciting career path. Your insights would be really helpful. I'm sure you're quite busy, but we're grateful to connect on the phone. May I have 20 minutes of your time to learn from you uh, what would work best. Thank you in advance. So hopefully what you can take away from this email uh, example is there's an intro of commonality. I'm reaching out to Rachel and I'm showing how we know each other or how we, how we are connected to each other. Uh, I'm sharing with Rachel, I'm interested in her career path and her experience and I'd love to learn more. And I'm have, I have a call to action at the end. So I'm actually asking for information. Uh, I'm, I'm telling her why I wanna have a next step and have a conversation. Um, and again, you could do this, obviously connect on the phone, you could change that to Zoom right now because everyone's doing that. I think that's the, like I said, that's a cool thing that's changed. So this is just one example. It's not, I wouldn't say it's like the catch all template, but it accomplishes what we want to accomplish. Um, and then if you look at a LinkedIn example, you all know, right? We, we all know that when we reach out on LinkedIn, when we make a connection with someone, we only have 300 characters, unless we're sending an email. We have 300 characters we have to stay within. This, is, this accomplishes the same thing the last message did, but as you can see, uh, I kept it under 300 characters. So it's, hi Rachel, I'm working professional MBA student at McCombs, exploring career path and product management. Sire an alum with a wealth of industry experience in this field. As a fellow Longhorn, would you be willing to give 20 minutes of your time the next week or two for a call so I can learn from you? So again, accomplishes the same thing, intro, why, the purpose of us having a conversation, making a call uh, to action. Okay, so you can do this on LinkedIn, you can do it through email. Um, and by the way, with follow-ups, if someone doesn't respond, remember, we're all busy, things happen, you can follow up every five days, three, four times at most. After four times, if someone doesn't reach back to you and you see they're reading your message on LinkedIn, uh, time to probably move on. But most people, again, know what it takes, know, know how hard it was to network and want to get to a place where they can um, help others and pay it forward. Most people by nature are good people. And so if you really take this approach of, hey, I just want to learn. I just want to learn about you and your path. When you start off with, I want a job, or I saw you have a job post, I, or I just applied for this job, I'm hoping you can help me. Why would somebody help you if they don't know you, or they don't trust you, or they don't know what you're actually trying to do? Um, you've got to earn that and cultivate your network to get that. Okay, a couple more examples, and then we'll jump into questions. Uh, request uh, network search. So this is important for your current job. How many of us have sat down with our current employer and requested feedback, um, talked about our career goals, designing specific career goals, and talking about taking on additional projects? Now may be the time for you to do that. If you're in a job and you want growth, have you asked for it? Don't put it all on your manager to come to you with a promotion because you've done such a great job. Maybe your expectations aren't in alignment with their expectations. Don't wait for a year-end review. Don't wait for you know, just a, a formalized process. Have these conversations regularly to engage with your current employer. Reconnect with former colleagues. You know, people that learn, reconnect with people now uh, during this time where you can call, you know, reach out and see what they're up to. I just saw one of my, one of my old uh, employees I managed at Texas and I hired is not working at Amazon. Um, and I found out when we set up a call, it's, it's crazy. Like if you don't, we forget sometimes where our connections are and it's easy because time gets crazy, but um, it's, make that a priority if you really want to grow and, and, and cultivate your network. And then joining groups, right? You're already part of this Austin Young Chamber, which is fantastic. Um, signing up for events, 
you know, social events, seek out a mentor or a few mentors. I know the EYC has a really great mentorship program I'm a part of. I, I love it. Um, find other mentors. Volunteer your time and skills and it will pay off. Um, and this is kind of a recap of what we already said, but um, always make sure you're following up too. When you attend an event, make sure you follow up. The number one thing people do to, to, to um, fail, I think, at cultivating a network is they make that initial connection and then they don't follow up. There's nothing that comes from it. It doesn't grow. And obviously, there's some other groups here. Uh, I know I, I have my students who are interested in careers in a variety of different industries, checking out these sites, networking in Austin, built in Austin, um, American Inno, which does a lot of tech stuff. There's just a lot of other places. So make sure you're, you have it coming from all angles to learn and also see where opportunities are. Read the Austin Business Journal or wherever you are, right? Um, and, and learn about what's happening. Be educated in, in your community on these topics and you'll find natural opportunities to network as well as learn. So you'll be more prepared. The more you read, leaders are readers. So the more you read, the more you keep up to date with what's happening. You'll sound more educated. You'll be more educated on these issues. So when you have real conversations, you'll be able to provide more value to people in those conversations and you'll impress those that you network with. All right. I know I didn't cover everything, but I, that was the high level stuff. So let's get into questions and I'm gonna close out of this and stop my share. And here we go. All right, thanks, Max. Uh, love that high level overview. Such great facts in there um, and things we can take away. It looks like we do have some questions that came through. So let's jump right in. Uh, first, we have Janie who's asking, I would like to know how to stand out on a video type interview platform. I recently had my first video interview and found it very unnerving. Needless to say, the position went to someone else who did just a hair better than I did in the interview. For the next time I have an opportunity come up, what can I do to stand out in a video style remote interview such as Microsoft Teams? Yeah, so um, Janie, first of all, um, you know, I'm sorry to hear that you didn't feel like it went well. Um, and sometimes it's easy. To, we're, we're always our toughest critics. So I'll also say this. Um, you may not have done as, as, as badly as you thought, or you know, even though you might have felt it was unnerving. Uh, I think all interviews to some extent can feel that way. What I would say is it's always just like a, an athlete who goes back and looks at game film. Um, one of the things you can do to prepare is practice your interviews live. We do this with students at McCombs, but um, practice you know, how you appear on camera. Maybe it was your background that maybe um, wasn't appealing. Maybe it was, um, you know, your, your pausing or the volume or the tone that you spoke with. Um, I, one of the things I found, and I don't, again, I, I wasn't there for your interview, but one of the things I found uh, in some of the interviews I've, I've done mock interviews with students is we, we are different when we're in person than we are sometimes on the, on the camera. We can, at least we can at least be perceived that way. And energy is very important as well. And so I've got some students who I've worked with who, wow, in person, like, they show all this energy, but now all of a sudden you put them in front of a camera so they kind of let the guard down and it seems a little more mundane. Not saying that's what you went through, but I would say have, just practice, practice, practice. Um, I mean, it could be a lot of things. It could be, I have students working on their value proposition, which is sort of your 30 second elevator pitch. When someone says, tell me about yourself. I don't know how yours went, but a lot of times when people say, tell me about yourself, if you just walk on through your resume for 20 minutes, um, you know, that can really make this person go, oh man, this seems mundane. All I can tell you is it's much easier on video to seem mundane, boring, to blend in with the crowd, to stand out, be you, um, create a strong value proposition, answer questions with star stories, which is you know setting up the situation, the task, the action you took, strong result. Um, those are just some things that I would recommend that you do on video and then have your colleagues give you feedback. Do it with anybody, do it with a friend and say, did I seem like myself? What was different about me on video versus how I am in person? And maybe that will help you. Thanks, Max. Next question. During this time, Andrew's asking, during this time, what are ways to bring colleagues together to, an, to network that are in a group setting instead of a one-on-one -on -one setting? Yeah, um, I mean, you're gonna have to do, you're gonna to have to set up you know, Zoom calls and, and, and things like, th like this, um, setting up a peer group. Uh, I went to a Tony Robbins event, in, um, or to several of his events, and one of the things I learned from that um, was a thing called you know, creating power groups um, in peer groups. And so having those power in peer groups, 
creating a, maybe it's, it's to give yourself some accountability with it. Set it, you know, monthly or every or biweekly to talk about things that you're doing or working on. Um, and those, I mean, I'd leave it up to you as terms of what topics and who you want to have in those groups, but we are who we associate ourselves with. We become more like those people. And so having strong and powerful groups that you can uh, rely on um, to get, uh, to get together and, and really just talk shop, talk industry, make each other better. It's all about growth. And I think, um, I guess it's up to you to how you want to structure it, but, um, I would definitely recommend it. Great. Next question. How will the high unemployment rate impact a job search right now? Okay. I'm glad this came up. Here's how it will impact it. Uh, and I think the numbers are at 36 million plus, right, unemployed. And there, there may be more. I mean, there's all kinds of conversations about, who, you know, some people aren't getting what they're, when they're reporting it or whatever. But the bottom line is this. It, it is a competitive marketplace. And um, because of that, because think about all the people that are out of work searching. Um, and so the stakes get raised. And prior to COVID-19, it was already competitive. I mean, take my company, for instance, Amazon. I mean, thousands of people apply for the same job or hundreds or thousands, depending on the job, right? How does Amazon even sift through that? I mean, they've got great recruiters. They rely on referrals. And where do those referrals come from? From somebody's network that got to know that, that would stand behind that person's reputation. And so I would even tell you prior to COVID-19, when a job was posted and there was an opportunity, you had to take additional steps to, to get in with a company. It wasn't just about applying for a job and matching your resume with theirs. It was about crafting a strong value prop. It was about practicing your interviewing skills, but more importantly, finding a way into the company through a network or referral. And so building, I call it a lamp list, or we call it a lamp list, but building 40 companies uh, out for yourself, I would recommend this before all this, but building about 40 companies or so that you're targeting and finding out which connections do I know in the company or who can I reach out to, and then cultivating that. So when there is a job that's open, that person can serve as a referral source for you. I was recommending that before, but now more than ever, now you're up against stiff competition. So the one thing I would say is we can't be too selective right now. If you are looking to make a change, you've got to ask yourself how happy you are in your current job or um, if you think there's a layoff coming, you know, don't, don't, I always say don't run from jobs, run to jobs, right? Have more of a strong pull factor than a push factor, if you will. But at the same time, if you get an opportunity with a company and it's like, man, I really like this company, but it doesn't see, it's not the perfect job. It's not what I envisioned I was going to take as my next step. That's okay too, because I'll tell you right now, I, Amazon tells you, get in with the company. You get in with us, all kinds of things open up. There's 750,000 employees, there's jobs all, all over the place, right? But a lot of times, the, the, the best jobs will go to those already in the company. And so I was working with my students on this because I talked to enough recruiters. And you got some students who are a little too, I'd say, prideful. Uh, they don't check the ego at the door. It's like, no, I'm only going to take the senior product manager job because I've worked, I'm getting my MBA. If I'm getting my MBA, I can't take a step back, right? Step back. Sometimes, and I think now is a time where you may want to consider a stepping stone uh, to get in with the company of your choice. If it's not the perfect job, but you bring skills and they offer you, if you're great at sales and someone offers you a sales job, but you want to eventually get to marketing or director of marketing, great, get in with the company. If you love what that company stands for, if they meet your, your check boxes on that little life matrix I was showing, if it meets all that, well, get in with the company and grow, right? And find out what that growth looks like and come up with a plan. But the way it's changing it is people have to probably be a little more a little less selective in that sense, be able to take a little bit more of a chance on something if they believe in the company. I would strongly advise that now because it's probably not the best time to be over picky. Perfect, and you answered a second question in the queue, so we'll just mark that one as answered um, about following your passion and um, the stepping stones. But next question is, um, so when is the right time to look for a new job? You know, I'm sure there's some people who are in a job situation right now um, and then others who are looking for that next opportunity. But, you know, when is the right time to look for a new job based on your passions and your values and what's happening in your current, um, in your current situation? Yeah, I mean, the, the tough part about that, it's a great question, is, is it really is customized to you. But I think when we talk about doing, you know, a market assessment or assessment, a personal assessment of where you're at, if you're being honest with yourself, are you doing work that's fulfilling to you? And what does fulfilling even mean? Because we're all motivated by different things. I mean, I've got, I have friends that when I worked in, I worked, I did sales for the Dallas Cowboys. And I, I was never really uh, 
money motivated person, it, especially when I took that job. I think maybe now over time I have become a little bit more financially driven, but I think um, I, I was, I, I knew there's some other people that they were in sales just to make money and they didn't care about necessarily how the product was used by the, 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 uh, the customers they were engaging with. But yeah, I mean, doesn't mean they weren't successful. It's just, you've got to find out what motivates you to determine your level of fulfillment and happiness. And so you've got to just do some assessments. I think that life matrix uh, thing for you could be really good to do. Do a life matrix, like put out your 10, uh, your 10 career priorities and score your company right now on that. Um, and if it's not matching or you feel like you're far from, uh, far from that, you know, you can score it on an A scale or A through F scale and see what, see if that looks like a good report card to you. I mean, you can do whatever with that, but um, if, it's, if it's not fulfilling, why stay, right? I'd say, why stay? Uh, it doesn't mean leave this second, but it does mean maybe you do start looking. And I always say um, in sales, there's a funny, you know, there's a movie that came out a long time ago, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, they say, always be closing is like the joke in sales. I always say with networking, it's always be networking because the, sometimes the best jobs in life come from your network, not when you're looking for a job, but because you're so good at what you do, either your company saw something in you to promote you or someone else saw something in you and you got that call, right? And I had that recently with, with Amazon, right? So um, I think I don't, I, it's, it's personal for when you want to look, but I, I don't know. I liked, I was checking the job boards for my own students because that's what I, my previous job was. But I like to check those things just to see who's hiring and why and what they're doing. And, um, and sometimes that can lead to stuff. But I always say keep a pulse on things regardless. But you'll know when it's the right time. If you're not hitting those priorities and you feel stuck and you, you do some deep dives on why you're stuck um, and then you find a company or you talk to someone at a company and they're like, oh, here's what you love about this. And you start feeling that pull of, oh, you know what, I think it's time for make a change. But you got to be real with yourself. Why do you really want it? You know, don't leave out of fear. Don't, I wouldn't leave out of fear. I wouldn't leave just because it's more money. I mean, that's me, that's me personally, but um, you've got to take, take into account those several factors and then, and then make sure they're in line with what you truly want. That's the best advice I can say without customizing your approach. Thanks, Max. Um, Elise says she really liked your comment on readers are leaders and would love to know of any other amazing books or publications that you'd recommend. Yeah, I mean, oh my goodness. Well, it depends what you want to learn about specifically, but um, you know, I, I remember, I mean, you can do a Google search. There's a really good list of books for like, if you're getting interested in getting into leadership um, or management. Um, it was, I think I literally searched by find this one day, top 50 management books. And I went through and I was like, wow, I agree. Cause I'd read like nine of them. And I was like, I agree with almost how they ranked them. And I can send you this list offline, but um, I'm always, I always, Google's a pretty awesome thing. Cause you can find, you know, almost anything you want, or at least get some suggestions. Um, and so some of the books that have changed my life in terms of how I think about the world, um, there's a book called Extreme Ownership by Jocko Willink. Uh, Jocko, and I'm sure you've all seen TED Talks, but Jocko gives a great TED Talks. It's basically about taking ownership of everything in your life. And he's a former Navy SEAL who was a part of several big missions. And he basically takes principles from the, the Navy SEALs and applies it to leadership and in the business world. Um, and it's amazing how much when you start thinking about those concepts and start applying them into your, to your everyday life and taking ownership of things, what that can do for you and your team and those that follow you. Um, I read a book called the compound effect. That was one of my favorites. Um, just because it talks about these little things and how they, how they add up to big things. And that's, that was great personally, because it was like, it wasn't just about, you know, what I was doing at work, but it was these little things, whether it's eating or exercising or or making time for family or whatever. Um, that was a really eye-opening book. Start With Why is a book by Simon Sinek that um, if you haven't seen his TED Talks, it's a 17-minute video. Uh, we just actually, it was funny, at Amazon Training Day 1, we showed that and, and walked through it. And there's a reason. Like, most people are motivated by, like, think about the world as what's, what I need to do, what skills I bring, all this stuff. Start With Why, going back to the last uh, question, your why is your most powerful thing right? It's, it's people will buy, buy your product and buy you on their team to hire you based on your why. Um, you know, I, I will, I have big goals for how I want to impact the world. And I speak to those when I interview. And I think that attracted a company like Amazon to me because they saw that I aligned with their 14 leadership principles and their, my why aligned with their why. Doesn't matter how skilled I am. 
and my what was there if I don't have a powerful why because I won't I won't stay with them long if I don't have that. So um, I think that's really important. But there's great podcasts out there. I mean, Tim Ferriss, Tony Robbins podcast. He has a book called also too called Awaken the Giant Within that I absolutely love. So there, I mean, I guess you know, hit me up after this if you want to get deep on specific podcasts or ones, but. I just start just start doing some searches like search for best podcast and leadership and you'll see like five or six and you'll go ooh or best sales podcast I listened to this one truth about selling the Jeffrey Gittimer sales podcast those are two of my favorites I found those because I searched for best um, best sales podcast and those two came up and I started listening to them and I was hooked it's like it's like Netflix right everyone told right. you go watch Tiger King and you watch Tiger King so you know right. follow follow the other follow the clues Right, right. We will be. I didn't watch Tiger King, by the way. I didn't think it was that. I, it didn't <laughs> interest me. We'll follow up with you, Max, to get um, a list of all the resources you recommend, and we'll be sure to send it out to those who are joining us today, so they have them. Um, so another question. I'm going to skip down to um, one that says, "How do we assess potential growth profiles of opportunities under current economic uncertainties, and more generally in highly volatile industries like energy, for example?" I think I, I think I understand this question. Let me read it again, just to make sure, because I see it here on the page. Um, sure. How do we assess potential growth profiles of opportunities under current economic uncertainties, and more generally in highly volatile industries like energy, for example? Well, here's the thing. Like everything, there are industries that are being forced to change. I just came from higher education, okay? Higher education is, it's not like higher education is not, you've been reading, I'm sure, about, you know, there's layoffs at schools or hiring freezes and budget cuts and all this stuff. It's not that it's not like industries are going to just go away. It, it's they're going to have to adapt and they're going to have to make changes. And that's actually again, I didn't even speak about this earlier. But that's the some of the positive effects of this is that it's going to force companies to do things um, that are going to be better for them long term. I mean, I at University of Texas, we weren't doing a whole lot of virtual training because we were so dead set on everything has to be in person. And I'm I'm all about that because I, I, you're seeing it. I mean, people learn better in person than they do virtually, but it's forced the University of Texas to go, hey, how can we incorporate this in some way? Because we have to in some way. And so now they're getting really good and they're realizing, oh, we could do happy hours with employers and actually we can do more of them and more connections for students. And so uh, I look at energy and there's probably going to be changes in energy that for the better um, in terms of, uh, you know, if, if we're getting away from oil or we're getting away from air transport, you know, look at Elon Musk's company, what he's doing with Tesla, maybe the underground rails or, um, you know, tunnels and stuff he's building are going to take off even more now. And I think what this, I think what this pandemic is doing is it's, it's accelerating things that were already happening and they're just happening faster now. Um, and some things will stick and some things won't, um, or sports. I came from the sports industry. What do we do? No fans are coming to games. And if they, if they can even open up stadiums, okay. Well, if we are in sponsorship sales, now we have more digital assets to sell. So maybe if I'm looking at a job in sports, I'm not looking at ticket sales. I'm looking at sponsorship as the way into that, that because they're going to need to, they're going to need to change that. And I have skills I can bring to a team to help them with their sponsorship or marketing efforts um, or to reach new, new clients across the country. Right. So there's just, you just have to look at each industry. Think, I would say, think about what's going to change. And this is where you got to read. I mean, you just got to, we all have, you know, the iPhones. Get on your phone and, and go, you know, subscribe to Industries for Apple News and you'll get a ton of, um, ton of stories and you'll start to see what's changing in each industry and how can I be a part of it if I, if I am. But, um, you know, there will be lasting change. Not all of it's positive, but I also think it's going to force people to think differently and that can be really good, especially if it's going to be really good if you're, if you're aware of it and you know how to add value. Right. Um. Zuleika is asking, I'm looking to change careers in the middle of this pandemic. Most of my existing network comes from my previous career path. How do I start diving into a network completely different than the one I'm currently in? How do I find those people? Great. So that's, that's awesome, right? So um, kind of what we talked about earlier, um, get on LinkedIn, find using this, and if you're not on LinkedIn premium, I don't know if you've, if you've thought about this, but premium, they'll do like a, a trial for you for 30 days. Like I'd say now is a better time than ever to be doing that kind of stuff. Uh, and even after that, it's like 30 bucks a month, but premium career, premium business allows you to do more searches and have an un, unlimited number of searches for people and industries. And what you can start to do is again, create a lamp list 
of, I call it LAMP, but it's, 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 it's like create a list of your top, you know, 20, 30, or even 40 companies. And you could find those companies um, by, you know, who are 10 dream, I could do 40 right now. Who are 10 dream companies you've always thought about working for? Who are, um, or in an industry, if you're looking at one industry, if you're going to go to that industry, what the 10 companies right off the bat stand out to you? Then take 10 more companies off of your connections you have on LinkedIn to anyone. You might find 10 more that way. You might go on indeed.com and search, um, you know, marketing or energy. And I'll find new jobs. You go, oh, I just found 10 more companies because I, I, I searched a keyword or an interesting job title and I found more companies that way. Or health and fitness comes up. You'll find companies you never even thought of. Maybe then the goals of the lifetimes like where I worked. Uh, and then you'll, you can also look at your, um, like I, I gave you those examples earlier, builtinaustin.com, Austin, you know, I can't tell how many tech companies I found just by re keeping up with those journals. So now I've got 40 companies, okay? How do I reach out to people? Go on network, go on LinkedIn, reach out to job titles that interest you. So if it's marketing, if it's sales, um, if it's supply chain or strategic management or strategy or consulting, search those in the, in the search fields. Um, we could do a whole tutorial on this, but you know, search for job titles and then reach out using that little template I showed you earlier and just ask for someone's time. Say, hey, I came across your profile. I'm thinking about making, you can actually say, I'm thinking about making a switch into your industry. You have a really interesting background and career path. I'd love to just take 20 minutes of your time if you don't mind to learn, learn from you. Um, and then set up that call. And then when you get that person on the phone or through Zoom, you can ask them who else do you think, who else they think you should talk to? Or what other company should I be looking at? What job function should I be looking at based on what you know about our industry, this industry? And so, you'll, you know, one person has, you know, thousands of other connections and it could lead to other things there. But the more you do that, give yourself some accountability. Like maybe it's, two or three unique connections a week. If you did that, you know, you'd already be exponentially increasing your network. Um, you can reach out to recruiters. It depends on the company. Um, recruiters or talent development specialists or HR. Yeah, they, they will. My experience is hiring managers that give more of their time because recruiters are stuck in it. It's kind of funny how that works because recruiters, it's like their job to find talent, but they get so much inbound that I think that sometimes they're not quick to respond or they're not open to it. Whereas a VP of marketing or director of marketing, they might not get a lot of those messages and they're like, Oh, this person wants to learn. I'll give back that time. Right. So, um, but it, you can do it from, I always say have things coming from all angles. Don't just uh, search in one spot or search one type of job title. If you're passionate about a company, find people in different spots and ask for the, ask for their time. And then from there, follow up and, and get involved. And um, you can track that, like keep an Excel spreadsheet of everyone you've talked to at these companies and beyond your LinkedIn, that way you'll know at Amazon, I have six connections. At Indeed, I have five connections. At Google, I have this many. And that way, when, when jobs do open, you can say, hey, I saw this job open. I know I really enjoyed our last couple conversations. Any suggestions on how I could, how I could put my best foot forward? And now this person knows you. So they'll be willing to, more than likely willing to at least put your name out there. I mean, I know I'm doing that at Amazon. If, if someone gets to know me and we have a referral system, like if somebody has a good connection with me, I'll refer them if I feel like I can, I know them well enough to, to state, you know, my reputation behind it. So. Okay, and you touched on the learning interviews, which um, there is a question here that I wanted to, to go ahead and ask. So with those learning interviews, once you get that appointment, obviously you're going to get out what you put in. And so how do you go about crafting the questions that, um, that you ask this person who's given you their all right, I think, Lisa, I think I heard most of what you asked, but I see the learning interview question here. I think it says your bandwidth was low for a second. It's okay. Yep, uh, I think that happened. Ask the right Thank you, Internet. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> I'm back on. <laughs> Any rules or insight? Um, yeah, so when you look at a learning interview, um, to put your best foot forward, um, again, Focus on the intent of learning. That's why we call it. That's why I call it that. A lot of people call them informationals. But when you, when you lead off with, like, first of all, you want to control the conversation. So when you set it up, I like to send someone an email with my resume still the day before, um, like maybe the day before the call or day of, and say, hey, here's my resume. Just so you have some background on me. That way they can like know who you are. They might be intrigued by your background. It allows for more of a conversation. When you start the call, it's like, Thanks, Alicia, for your time. As I mentioned in my email, I really want to spend some time just learning a little bit about your career path, your background, 
what it's like to work for um, for Apple. And you know, I'd really just like to to pick your brain a little bit. Uh, is that cool if I just ask you some questions about that? Sure. Yeah. You still have about you know forty five minutes today. Great. So I great. I guess a great place for us to start is can you walk me through your background uh, or walk me through your path to Apple? Like if I start with that, it lets Alicia talk about herself. And what's great about that is people like talking about themselves, right? And they'll appreciate they get to share. And so if, if you just come off there and go, yeah, the purpose of this call is really for me to just, you know, get in with Apple. And so can we just talk about like how I can get in with Apple and what jobs are open and how, how often are they hiring and all that stuff. Then it's so transactional. It's not relationship based. Get to know the person. And when they tell you about their background, you might, something might stick out in there that's a commonality. Like, ooh, so you did that certification? I actually did that too. And here's what I got out of it or whatever. And then you can ask more specific questions about the company. What's culture like? Um, I have a whole list I've sent out to students before, but there's a list of, and you can Google this too, right? Best interview questions to ask or best learning interview questions to ask or informational questions to ask. Um, but it's like, it's, it's the things you want to know about. What's the company like? What's the, the job function like? What are they like most about work? What are they most proud of? What are things they don't like? What are areas of opportunity for their business? Um, when, they hire, when they hire people, I like asking people, like, what are, what are the things that your company looks for? What do you look for in somebody? Because guess what? If they say three things that you're all about, that'll be a good time for you to, like, be like, oh, that's something. I'm so glad you said that because as I've been exploring Apple, I wanted to, you know, I actually was hoping that they, that they look for those types of things because that's actually what I bring to the table, right? And now you're showing there's alignment with you in the brand. So um, getting to know them, if you're going to have a conversation about job stuff, definitely do it towards the end and you could ask a question that's more soft but still gets the point across of so you know Alicia I really enjoy this conversation everything you're sharing with me only further demonstrates that Apple is a great place to work and god I, I just you know I'm so amazed at your background and everything you've shared I guess what I'm wondering is is how would someone like me um find a way to Apple do you recommend any I talk to anyone specifically in the marketing department because I'd love to you know I'd love to explore opportunities. What would you do if you, what would you do if you were me? You know, now you're not saying, will you connect me with your, your five closest people at Apple that can get me a job, but you're putting the ball in their court to see if, if you, they were you, what they would, what they would do. And it's a very soft way of doing it, but it accomplishes the same thing. Do you guys see the difference? Like it's not, it's not, Hey, you must be really close with these people. Or, or I saw a job posted. Can you, can you refer me? They might not feel comfortable doing that or they might, but let them come tell you that. And then of course, when you wrap up these learning interviews, have a next step. Hey, Lisa, I really enjoyed this conversation. I actually really think I could continue to learn from you. What would be a good time for us to reconnect? So I'd love to stay in touch, hear what you're up to, hear what Apple's up to. Uh, and at least you might say, check in with me every month, check with me every three months, check with me at the end of the quarter, whatever. So um, whatever that is, you have permission. And then mark that on your little spreadsheet that you're keeping track of your outreach. Mark that and say, I'm going to reach out, you know, in May, whatever, right? Love that. Um, so we have a question here. Um, I have been applying to hundreds of jobs in six months with very few returns, despite several revisions to my resume, even revised by a professional writer. What do you advise to increase the response rate? Well, what I can tell you about resumes is resumes are tools. They're not ways to get interviews. Um, they're one way. Um, they're, they're snapshots of your, of your path. They're snapshots of your background, but they're not you. And so I guess I'd have to look at your resume. Um, but if you're not getting returns on your resume, it's possible it's your resume. It's possible that also, I don't know what jobs you're applying for. It's possible that you're applying for jobs that are super, I mean, if you apply to right now to six jobs on Amazon with your resume, if you don't have a referral source in with the company, there's probably a good chance you still may not get a call back. I don't care how good your resume is because there's that many people applying for jobs. And so I don't know where you're applying, but what I would say is, does your, the big thing I could say is, does your resume fit the job you're applying for? If you're applying for product management and you don't talk about being customer centric or you don't talk about ways you've, uh, specific metrics and how you've grown, whether it's revenue or grown customer retention or et cetera, things like that, that would matter to a company hiring a product manager, then you probably wanna retool your resume to fit that job. Because you're gonna to wanna to retool your resume for pretty much every job you apply to, to fit that. You want your resume to say, this is a match for that. The other thing is, um, 
companies are using these ATS systems now. So if your first third of your resume doesn't have an executive summary or have the keywords that are in that company's profile, what they're looking for, you might get kicked out of the system, which is, that's why I'm saying like referrals work better than anything. But you also want to make sure that the first third of your resume, I, I would say have an executive summary at the top that talks about sort of, you know, that aligns those skills that you have, uses certain buzzwords and keywords that are in that job description to make sure you don't get kicked out of their ATS automatic system from a computer. Because that's a lot of these big companies, they're, they're just kicking people out who don't have that. But have someone review it. Make sure it's a page. You guys don't need, especially the Young Chamber, right? Uh, you, only, you only need a page. You have anything more than that, it's too much. Every bullet on your resume should have what you did, how you did it, and what was the impact. I see so many resumes that look like job descriptions. I managed a team of eight people. Great. What did your team accomplish? How did you accomplish it? Did you show me your unique skills and strengths as a leader? It, your resume is your only chance prior to having a conversation to sell yourself. So it's got to tell me what you did, how you did it, why you did it or what the impact was. Because companies are looking to hire people that are making an impact on the value, not just did you do a job, right? If I see you're a sales rep, I know you sold products. I wanna hear about your numbers, I wanna see some highlights, maybe some things you did above and beyond your job, right? When I worked for the Cowboys, during the end of my, uh, closer to the end of my tenure there, I started helping other sales reps because I was pretty successful and I put that on there because it's like, yeah, everyone knows if, as a sales rep, I'm selling for the Cowboys, but what did I do above and beyond? I went on appointments with other reps. I helped coach and train and develop younger reps. And so highlighting those things too are really, really important. Um, but remember, just all I can tell you is resumes are just a tool. It's not the reason you're not getting a job nine times out of 10. It's, it's something else. Um, meaning, meaning you didn't build a network. You didn't find someone on the inside. Um, or maybe, um, or again, remember, it, it, sometimes it's just, it's hard, right? It's competitive. So maybe it's just that. It's just a competitive time. They found, maybe they posted the job and they have an internal candidate and they're just posting it to collect resumes. And that happens too. Okay, we have two questions left. I think we'll have time to get to them both. Um, going back to the life matrix, um, what's the best way to identify one's values in that matrix? Um, I think when you do design your, I would encourage everyone on this call, if you're, you're obviously, interested in, in growing your career. I would encourage you to, there's two books that I would think about. Um, there's a book called Switchers, which is about switching job functions, companies. And then there's, and you could also, there's YouTube videos with each one. Um, but I would also look at this book, uh, Design Your Life, because I think that'll really help get the brain flowing um, about what you truly want and what's important to you. And actually, it forces you to come up with a plan if you were to go do that thing. Like, they even do this exercise where they're like, if you lost your job today, what would you do next rationally? And then if money, if everybody was paid $50,000 for every job in the world, what would you do? Okay. And then, so even like exercises like that, where you're forced to do those things, and then you create words and bubbles off of those, it's hard to explain. But exercises like that allow you to tap on your subconscious of what truly matters to you. So yeah, it, it, like again, start with why. If you read Start With Why or watch the TED Talks, Start With Why with Simon Sinek, he talks about like, we make our best decisions when we make those with our limbic portion of our brain, which is our emotional part of our brain. It's the thing when our heart tells us, um, I get this feeling about this, or I don't feel right about this, or I do feel right about this. Um, you wanna make more decisions with your heart than just your up here. Because up here can limit you. Up here, if you get too much in your head and try to overthink everything, as opposed to what you truly want, you'll start making decisions that just seem rational, but they're not, they're not what you really want. Um, and again, for me, I've had different moments. I mean, I've worked in sports and in education and in health and fitness, and now I'm with a tech, tech and e-commerce company. But I can honestly tell you, I've never worked for a company that I wasn't extremely passionate about their mission. That has always been a driving force. And to this point, I'm yet to have like a really bad experience, at least with the company, right? I've had, bad bosses and stuff like that. Everybody has that. But as far as like, I never regretted anything I did because I was following my, what was truly important to me, right? I knew when I was working with the Cowboys that at some point I'm going to want to lead people and it may not happen here, but I'm going to find a place that is going to allow me to grow as a leader. And that was the Cleveland Browns. And then, you know, the opportunity at UT, all of a sudden I go from lining pockets of billionaire owners to helping student athletes and, and watching money go be, be reinvested in university. That was inspiring to me. And then I said, oh, 
maybe I like the college environment, right? Like, so you just have these different light bulbs that go off throughout your career. But I guess I can tell you that sit down and really think about it. Um, if you don't, if you don't redesign really your life first, what's really important to you and be honest with yourself. Don't make it compensation just because everyone else is telling you you need to make more money. Like maybe you don't need to make more money. Maybe you need to just be more conscious with your money and save, but you'd be more happy doing fulfilling work that actually feels like you're making a difference. Like part of my thing is you saw on my list, contribution was my number one. I need to contribute to something greater than myself or I'm not going to be fulfilled at all. I don't care how much you're paying me. Um, and so I'm doing that now and I've done that other places I've been, but uh, I think everybody just gets so focused on, on, you know, we're influenced by our peers. And I think a lot of times we are used to people or our parents telling us, you know, what we should go do with, I got a law degree. I'm not even practicing law. You think I haven't had that conversation with my mom? My parents are like, what the heck? You went to law school and I've been practicing. Hey, law school was great. It taught me how to think and I use it every day, but I didn't want to be a lawyer. I saw it. I saw in law school, like what it would take to be a lawyer and like what the day to day was. I did my research. And I'm like, this is, I'm learning so much about how to, how to debate, how to analyze problems, how to solve problems, how to write persuasively, think analytically, but I'm going to be a different, I'm going to do something different with my law degree. I said that from pretty much my first year of law school. I said that, and that's what I did. And I've got friends that finished law school and they became lawyers. And some of them are really happy because they love the law, right? They're obsessed about it. And they, and I've got some friends that are like, they're bored, right? Like they did this because they felt pressure because they made the decision to go to law school. So they, they didn't feel like they could ever pivot and they're stuck or they feel stuck. The reality is you're never stuck. You just have to give yourself enough leverage to make a change, but you've got to decide what really matters to you and trust your gut. Thanks, Max. Last questions. We have about two minutes left. Um, so for this last one, um, with regards to growing and cultivating networks, is LinkedIn the best platform for staying in touch and seeing where people are now, or are there others that you recommend as well? Uh, I mean, I'd say LinkedIn is probably just from a professional standpoint, it's the best way to, to stay in. It's the best way to see where things are. I mean, the first thing when people take a new job, they update their LinkedIn and from a professional standpoint, right? You know, Facebook and Instagram are great for social, whatever, but, um, or, or the TikTok now. But um, I would just say LinkedIn, in my experience, what I've seen is, is that has just been a, I mean, everyone's on it now and it links directly to people's personal emails because most people don't even put their professional email on. Like it's, people have it on their phone. Like it's, it's become, I mean, I got my MBA in 2008. It was just becoming a thing. And back then it was like, maybe people check their LinkedIn and now I find people are, but use your other resources. All of us went to, or a lot of us went to colleges on this call. So what about your alumni network? Have you reached out to your, your school and said, hey, do I have an alumni database I can reach out to? I mean, McCombs, we have an amazing one. There's 40,000 alumni on LinkedIn through the McCombs. Go to your, um, real quick tip, if you wanna find your alumni database on LinkedIn, go to, um, <clears throat> and this is how you can reach out to alumni at companies in, your, in the area. Go to, type in your, um, your school and then go to the school page and then click alumni on the left and it'll bring up all of your alumni that are on LinkedIn. And then you can actually filter it by like, company or job function. And then you can just start building your connections that way. Um, that's just one example, but your alumni, your, your, your different networks can, can, can connect you that way. And then like, obviously you've got this chamber group, right? And there's probably resources here for us to be connecting with. So um, there's social meetups, you know, other, uh, and, and I, I mean, I've, if you search like finance on the meetup app, you'll find all these fine, uh, these social meetup groups for finance, people are interested in finance or there'll be you know, professional development seminars. Go to things like that, and, and or virtually, attend them virtually, and you might find some really cool ways. But I'd say staying in touch with people professionally. I mean, I don't, I don't know of a better one than LinkedIn, um, just because they've, they've really kind of created a nice little stranglehold on, on making sure people use it. Sure, well, Max, again, I wanna say thank you for taking the time to join us today and sharing some really valuable information about career searching and networking, especially during COVID-19. Uh, to our members and guests who have joined us today, thank you for hopping on and spending your lunch hour with us. Please remember to keep an eye on the Austin Young Chamber website and social channels for more information on upcoming webinars and virtual events. We look forward to the next time you can join us and hope you stay healthy and safe. Thank you. Thanks, add me on LinkedIn and stay in touch. Thanks, Max. Bye-bye.